Cat. It's Maximus here. This is the promised uh, follow-up video to the teardown of the new DeWalt Extreme Subcompact Brushless Cordless Drill. Too many words in a product name. So these do have stickers. You always have to be careful about that. And we got one on the back and one here in the handle that's holding the split clamshells together. So you'll want to go ahead and uh, slice those. Just find the the little seam, and I'm going to have to look off to the side, make sure I keep that in camera. You just find the little seam with the little X-Acto knife, and just do a little slit with the sticker. And the same thing down here, and that's how you make sure you can get it apart, and you don't have to deal with the sticker coming up and not wanting to stay down. And Whoop, I didn't quite get that perfect, but that's fine. All right, we got to pull out those T10 screws. So I was saying, you know, they found a decent balance, and the drill is higher performance. It would seem, or the way the nature of the drill, it really, because it's constantly engaged, does, you know, pull down the batteries so the power gives. I actually wish they would have made it 1,200 RPM in second gear. That way it would have had a better second gear. And somebody has suggested I try out and maybe uh, do a review of the the new brushless 12-volt impact wrenches, and I may do that at some point. I don't know if I'm going to pick up one of those little 12-volt impact wrenches, but uh, maybe we will. We'll take a look here. We'll get these uh, eight screws out of the handle. I like to do the handle first. Let's get the rest of these out. I kind of do weird cuts. Sorry about the choppiness of the last video. I was having a hard time editing. I am not a video editing expert. Uh, you know, if I ever get to a point of hiring an editor, uh, I will. I'll put it that way. Definitely will. So this is kind of uh, an interesting design where we have eight screws there and then they have the cross screwed gearbox it does make it uh, a bit more stout so we have a total of 12 screws and uh, I don't know where my little long bit is but we'll just have to use there is it is some pretty stout nylon that they're using in this and even these little screws actually are held in pretty tightly they really uh, made those holes you know a little bit smaller just to prevent these screws from coming out and indeed, the gearbox screws are the same length as everything else on the tool, which is nice. You don't have to worry about keeping track of any of these screws. The Walt does have parts lists up for this now. I also noticed they had a hammer drill, but there's some imagery. Really, it looks like it's about a half inch longer, and it has a metal-bodied version of this chuck, not a carbide tooth chuck. Um, I think this little thing has too little weight for a hammer drill version, unless you're just hanging like signs on brick walls. Uh, the nature of a hammer drill, they work much better with a heavier tool. That's why corded hammer drills always seem to work so much better than cordless. is because they generally are a higher mass tool, which means more energy is going into the bit. Um, and I only ever use a hammer drill when I, you know, just a tiny hole. If I'm drilling holes in masonry products, I'm using rotary hammers. that actually get it done, not just make a bunch of vibration and noise. And on the bigger drill, it's kind of a combination system where it's all kind of locked together. The clamshells hold onto the gearbox, and then the gearbox is indeed, uh, excuse me, it's the opposite. The gearbox kind of holds together the clamshell, so you just need a little bit of play so it can all kind of come apart. So the DeWalt parts list, and this is pretty, oh, come on now. What are, am I, oh. Oh, that's interesting. They have an alignment pin right here. You'll want to make sure not to bend that. That's kind of keeping everything straight. I actually like that a lot. That's a pretty interesting idea. And then there is our clamshell. Do we have a grade on it? We do. We have a bunch of schmoo. I should have mentioned that we probably should have made sure that the gearbox was set to the lowest position because it's a spring-loaded clutch system, so it'll reduce pressure. Anyway back to the grade is this uh, there it is polypropylene glass fiber 30 PP not uh, nylon that's kind of interesting that it seems like a little bit of a it seems okay but I don't know how good probably probably propylene is not as good as nylon I believe uh, and that's kind of a little bit disappointing to see but on sale they're selling an awful lot of technology for 99 bucks the batteries and the tool and the charger Let's just take a look at this thing. I mean, these are the mo these are modern tools. I mean, the entire interior of that clamshell is 100% packed full. 
And for the more technical uh, fishing autos, we do have some actually pretty large. That appears to either be 18 or 16 gauge primary wire leads and the three main power light leads for the three phases of that brushless motor. The other thing that we can see, which is an upgrade from the bigger tools, is these are metal capacitors. These are known as aluminum polymer capacitors or solid capacitors. They're actually more expensive. They are a much higher grade. They can have average lifespans of 50 years or more, just fully functional, versus standard liquid electrolytic capacitors. These things uh, maintain their tolerances and have, on average, twice the lifespan. Expensive computer electronics, premium computer electronics, you know, gaming motherboards are going to have all aluminum polymer capacitors. That's really nice to see. If I can get a little bit more zoom out of this darn little camera, we can see that wire says 125 degrees Celsius. That's a very high temperature wire. So that's nice to see as well. That's about as high a temp as you can get without getting, you know, specially oven or heater rated wire. They do have a little bit of the space, the wires. I actually kind of like this because instead of having like these, these super microscopic little areas where you have to try to tuck the wires in if you do take it apart, this makes it a lot easier to deal with. Let's go ahead and pull out these uh, or pull apart these guts here and uh, take a little bit of a look. We'll give you a closer look at some of this stuff and then if anybody's more interested in the most de the more detailed part, we'll uh, I'll actually disassemble this gearbox. A lot of people seem to have trouble. That was always my big disappointment about that huge, huge tuber Ave. There are lots of things. I've been a computer person for a while and it took me 10 years to get over myself to start making YouTube videos, even though I've been watching it since that's, the site came out. Ave was always scared to take apart these gearboxes and would be confused. That guy is a genius compared to me, and uh, it's real pretty straightforward system to take apart one of these gearboxes. We can see that the gearbox actually has a fair, all the internals are steel. It is screwed together. That's a snap-on thrust cap right there. It's actually overall not so bad. They have a convolution in there. We can see that there's just actually quite a bit of grease and then that's how they keep it, attempt to keep it in there is a little ceiling and convolution with that stamp piece of sheet metal. It's nice to see that the shifting mechanism is actually steel in this. We can see how they have to cantilever the switch out uh, to get it all to all fit. But we will break that down. But for people who are more into the basics, at least taking these things apart is just super simple because um, it just all comes apart. That little switch comes out. There's our asset control tucked away right there in the handle. And I always like that. Who wants a little tracking device inside your tool? I should say that it worked okay. We are getting some grease out. The, the whole point is that they're putting a lot of grease in there because there's a lot of load on those gears. Uh, DeWalt is offering parts. This setup, they're not selling it separately. They charge you 60 bucks. If whatever goes out, you get a whole new this this assembly, 60 bucks, uh, 45 bucks or something for the gearbox. They sell it to you as an assembly. What is nice, and at least manufacturers have started doing that, doing it now. They used to, uh, if they only sold an assembly, such as this gearbox, when you went to the parts breakdown, that's all you got. It was just the image of this, this section of the gearbox. Uh, at least the Walt provides a full breakdown of this gearbox. It is a 12-gear gearbox, four gears on each of the three stages. And let's see if I can't pull out this rotor without... Sometimes they really do press in the bearings, and I really don't like to yank them out uh, too hard. Let me take a second. They have a real interesting design. You can get it apart, but this cap, it's actually a pretty tight fit. It has a little rubber vibration dampener, and you just have to pull and wiggle the back cap off a little bit. What's interesting is they have these integrated winding separators and retainers into this back cap. And now we can get this rotor out. There are really strong magnets in this, so you do want to kind of be careful when you... The rotors never really want to cooperate when you're pulling them out because they are just so strong there we go there's our tiny little rotor that's providing all the power we can actually see that they have a little rubber sealed ball bearing right there I don't know if we can see the front bearing but that if they have a rubber sealed on the rear I'm assuming they have one on the front and so that's always nice to see true ball bearing motor and we can see the other little tines so when this whole thing is 
pressed in and together. These create the winding separators which is and retainers, which is a pretty interesting design. And then here's our motor. This is our phase controller. It's going to have three little magnetic sensors that are going to ping off of this. This little brown ring is a tone ring, kind of like a cam position sensor in a vehicle. And there's three little sensors in there. That's what all these little wires are for, is to, for the Hall effect sensor. And then the three main wires are to drive all these coils. They do need to work on refining their winding machine. We can see like that coil right there is wound pretty nice. But then this coil right here is just getting a little bit funky and is kind of gnarly. That hurts the efficiency of the motor right there. That's going to be a little bit weaker of a pull. That's one thing I'll admit. At Makita Motors, Makita really tries hard to have nice windings. I've taken apart a lot of Makita Motors and like all their windings are really well, really nicely lined up. This is kind of a little bit hit and miss. They did not varnish this motor, meaning they did not dip it in a pardoning plastic resin like epoxy and I would have uh, appreciated if they would have done that and I don't know why my camera seems to be having such a hard time focusing on this thing it must just be because of uh, the change in depths anyway I think that's the end of the basic breakdown and a quick discussion of the motor in this unit I am gonna continue this video where I uh, break down this gearbox in detail otherwise Please subscribe. All right, continuing with the gearbox breakdown for, I guess we'll call more diehard viewers who really want to get into more details. To put the motor back together, I should have mentioned that you just kind of put in the back, or actually I put in the rotor first, just trying to be as careful as possible. It's going to scrape a little bit just because it's super powerful magnets. You know, at the factory, they have a plastic sleeve that they put around the rotor. That way they can push it in without any damage. There is actually just a little bit of play, like in this little front collar. It all kind of aligns when it gets in the case. If anybody's wondering how they prevent the rotor from turning, all those little fingers that go in between the coils, as well as these little dogs that interact with this in-molded piece that's actually holding the coils, has these notches with accompanying teeth right along there inside the housing, and that's actually what prevents the, you know, locks the motor in place to keep the field from wanting to spin around. And yes, like the little fan here, we can see is PA6633GF. So this is nylon. They went with a cheaper polypropylene handle. Uh, definitely not quite as heavy duty as the full size, which uses nylon uh, moldings. With gearboxes, uh, I, it's really pretty simple. Usually I just have a little hook, this, and a pair of uh, forceps here. One thing on all cordless drills, most of them, this little switch goes on top and these two little springs like to bounce out. But this on the switch, the little springs are for when you change the gearbox, how the, the, the ring gears, these collars have little dog teeth. And sometimes they'll hit on top of each other. And then the springs take up that motion. So when you go, they kind of drop down. But people have issues shifting gears because sometimes they sit on top of each other. And if you go just full throttle, they'll kind of skip. And so you want to like bump the trigger just a little bit after you change the gears and it ensures that you're not going to have uh, issues. Uh, I haven't had issues changing gears and cordless drills in forever. Ever since I took a gearbox apart, I was like, oh, that's just how they have to do it. So uh, kind of like a non-synchro mesh transmission, if you, uh, it's going to start tripping gears unless you're like f properly and fully engaged. So you just bump the throttle just a little bit. Let me get some paper towel here. I'm going to try to abbreviate this as much as possible. Taking apart these gearboxes is just, you know, do it in one order and then in the reverse order, kind of like Johnny Five, that movie Short Circuit, where he took apart the whole car. That was kind of funny. I always thought, what about the guy who actually got paid in Short Circuit to actually disassemble a car into every little piece and lay it all out? That must have been kind of a fun job. So we have a cantilever lever arm that engages a little uh, spring, which is what's controlling our gear changes. This, we just have to be real ginger, not to bend it all out of shape. And we just have to, just, just enough to get it to pop off the peg on this side. And then if we can shift it forward to give ourselves some clearance. Oh, come on now. There we go. Give it some clearance and then get it off. And now we have not damaged and bent up our little shifting lever, which would be unfortunate. 
it is symmetrical, so it doesn't matter which, you know, there is no forward or back. And usually it's the keeping track as we just, every part we take off, we're just going to line up. And it's, you know, nearly impossible and since uh, to, to mess it up. Let's go ahead and knock those four little screws out. We'll make that kind of fast and easy with this. See, these have a ton of oil on them. That's what's the one issue with the screws and plastic is these are, they probably could even be torqued a little bit more. I did some pretty heavy drilling, and it seems that they maybe have gotten just a touch loose. But the grease on the threads of a steel screw in the plastic just, man, it really reduces their grip, the friction and the gripping power. So this is going to all come apart now that I've done that. And we'll put the four screws up in the corner here, just like so. The only thing to make note of is in this situation we have an orientation. We have those little pegs right there for the shifting lever, and they, of course, go to the top. That's what's nice about setting the clutch to the lowest setting, as you always know. Number one is the top of the gearbox as you're fiddling around. On this style, what I try to do is I use, like a pick, I guess we can use the forceps here, is since this is a back piece that's going to come off, I'm actually going to try to hold down everything interior to the to the gearbox so the only thing that comes up is really just a shifting collar Whoop! we did lose some gears and that's what the forceps are for you do need uh, some way to grasp all these little parts and so whoop! let's get that aligned and so those are the little splines that engage with those splines here and what it's essentially doing when you shift in the second gear is you're bypassing the first stage of reduction and making it a two uh, a, a two-stage gearbox instead of a three-stage gearbox and so that spring is just for when this collar slides back and forth actually I'm a bit incorrect because there's a secondary ring in there and I'm trying to figure out it appears that it's using a slightly more complicated design where the ring gears is uh, interestingly enough when it's moved into the forward position which I assume is is that first or second gear in the forward position yeah forward position is second gear so it's actually doing two things. It's engaging splines as well as actually see how their teeth cut in the carrier that are right at the same spacing as the next set of gears. So it's actually engaging on the outside as well as locking up the gears on the inside. And so it's actually bypassing the second stage, not the first stage. These little gearboxes, I mean, they take, they're, it's real engineering. The real engineering isn't so much that motor. It's just all the mechanical engineering that goes into one of these planetary gearboxes. Nice and greasy. Let's go ahead and get these little gears out of here. I don't know how long this video is going to be, but this is a pretty, imp there's some people who take apart these little gearboxes, and I'm going to put in the uh, description that this is also just a general uh, high detail cordless drill gearbox breakdown. There's a couple out there, but um, it's really not that complicated. These things are just so greasy. That's the problem. These things are super duper greasy. Getting it all back together is always a little bit fun, trying to get everything together. There's our first carrier. Here's our second set of gears, which are different diameters. All the different combination of diameters that you have to work with in here to get the ratios that you want. We can already see that the second stage gears are thicker than the first stage gears. Part of that is because uh, the way the shifting mechanism uses part of the gear for the locking, they have to make them just a little bit wider. And I'm just going to go back and forth as I pull out the parts here. We have this collar, which also has a shim washer. This is going to be a separate piece, this little shim washer here. I'll leave it together. And then we have the next stage. Actually, we should pull it apart. We'll just do that. We have, when we pull this out, it would have been... And this is the kind of thing to keep in mind is exactly the, the order would have been like that, this, and then this. That's the proper order. That's how you, not get, you don't get confused. And now we get a look at our final stage, which we can see the gears have thicker teeth. It is indeed, and I think this is just fine, a gearbox. Some of these tools, really, there's been a lot of variation over the years of these, you know, how they balance out these gearboxes, and I think this is nice. Uh, 12 gears is a lot of gears. I mean, it's 12 gears. Obviously, now we can see that it is truly is 100% steel. There's a little trick to getting these ring gears out. You can spread the forceps and use them as kind of internal pliers. Come on now. 
it's a little bit funky sometimes using that method, but it there we go. It usually works. And see, there's the back side of our clutch mechanism. Mechanism. It's just springs that ride across this little ring. The little bumps you feel are those little bumps. There's our balls. Springs are behind those. Rotating collar is just a thread. It runs a little threaded plunger that goes against those springs. Under here would be our clutch. If we can get this thing up off, oh, it's a little bit different. Oh, it is a tight fit. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Look at that. There's like a little O-ring that kind of got bit a little bit. Interesting. I had to figure out what was going on here. That is not just a retention O-ring. It was pretty tight. It did tear, They did tear up the edge of that O-ring during assembly. Uh, one, a lot of tools have had only two of these. This is the one-way clutch, interestingly enough. There's a, the little pinion inside there. Let me get a flashlight. Here we go. I wonder if we can really get... Yeah, we can get a little better overview. I hate this little... So anyway, you can see that it has kind of an odd shape, concave with like little peaks. That's how this works, is when the truck tries to turn, those little peaks actually have a, a little ramp on them. It's The geometry is pretty complicated, and what that's doing is trying to force these little rollers out against the ring and lock it up. However, if you push on the roller itself, interestingly enough, I can't do it uh, because I can only push one roller at a time. You need that this ring here which has four little posts on it to push all the rollers simultaneously. When you push the rollers themselves, then they'll drag along the centerpiece without any friction and actually act as a rolling bearing element. A lot of older drills, they have like a little fork system that's in here, so you could actually pull them out. It, you get a little bit of chuck play, but you could just get rid of the one-way bearing. The, like on this, the wall, it actually relies on the sprag clutch bearings themselves to deliver power so you can't actually remove those bearings otherwise the drill won't work it also makes it particularly difficult uh, to remove this chuck with four sprag bearings you may have to do the allen wrench method and just hope the extra support that those bearings one that clutch will provide will be enough to remove the chuck but since they have this design how they built it at the factory is they have a special socket that is exactly the weird shape of that uh, and that holds on to the spindle while they screw on the chuck and it, it's a disappointing it's a serviceability issue although it is possible maybe a 12 a 6 point 8 point 12 point spline drive you got all these sockets like I do with all these different kind of shapes that you may be able to find one that just might work Anyway, I'm not going to make you sit through me reassembling this, but this is the inside of that DeWalt gearbox. Uh, these people know, and they have a general feeling on how to break down these gearboxes. Even though this, truly, if we took apart the chuck and all the other little parts, there may be 50 parts in here, but it's really not that bad to keep track of. And just put them out, you know, certain parts like this, which are actually directional, you know, you just lay them down on the tape just like they were when you took it apart. It was facing up when you took it apart, so put it down facing down, and you know when you reinstall it, it just is in the reverse order. Really pretty simple, and I've done a lot of, I've rebuilt my own, you know, all-wheel drive transmissions, and this method is great. I mean, I'm pretty good at uh, keeping track of a lot of parts. I grew up playing with Lego techniques, but nonetheless, this stuff, uh, if you just, you know, make sure you're not drunk or something then uh, it's really not a problem and I always find this kind of thing enjoyable the last thing I'm gonna do is compare the first second and third stage gears just so we can see uh, what they've done and I think that's really proper what they have done we'll put we'll stack them all on top of each other we'll use my better fingers <laughs> my better fingers there we go so we can see the difference in diameters but we can see the first stage with the lowest load is you know four uh, thin gears. The second stage has some ink, a bit thicker gears and we can see that the teeth are also uh, a bit sharp or excuse me have a bit greater cross section. Let's get some more zoom in there. And then of course on the final stage we have even thicker teeth still and that's proper and a proper quarter drill as you go through each of the stages as the load increases so do the, uh, the gears. So overall, I'm satisfied. I think that's actually a, a pretty good compromise, and this is actually a reasonably strong gearbox, uh, given the tool. 
anyway, I really appreciate everybody who has been watching and subscribing to my videos. Uh, it means a whole lot to me. And I uh, really appreciate all the comments and everything. I'm probably, I keep on saying I'm going to get better at the comments, but I think I'm going to like do a live stream. That way I can just answer a bunch of questions at some point just in real time. Maybe when I'm doing one of these breakdowns. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. And please subscribe. Caddis Maximus out. Quick footnote. Uh, two things. One, this little collar here, this inner ring actually does have some special stamping. It has this upper tab, which is not, that tab actually is not upper, it goes on the bottom. And the second thing is actually the outer diameter of these four gears is slightly more than this. So you can't just slide this over. This thing you actually have to take the little gears off, set them inside of here, get them spaced out just right so you can try to get this thing plugged into them. It's going to be a little bit of a hassle. It's always a hassle to get these things apart sometimes. But just wanted to put that note in in case somebody's having frustration just stacking it all up and trying to slide this over the top. You got to kind of build the first stage into this and then put it all together and hope you don't drop it.